Well, good morning, guys. Um, if I haven't met you before, my name is Hannah. I don't really know how to describe myself. Hi, other than I'm just a person who goes here. So, um, But I do believe that God has a message for us this morning that I am honored and I'm excited to share with you. Um, so, But if we could get started with this, since it's spooky season, does anybody want to hear a true crime story? Okay, so before you get excited or nervous, this is like Andy Griffith level crime story. So if you want to throw up the picture here, um, a couple months ago, I was walking in from my house after getting the mail, and I saw this, I don't know if it's hard to see, nosy, spray painted right in front of my house, and not to be dramatic, but my soul left my body. I was mortified. I was like, one of our neighbors thinks that we are nosy and spray painted it in front of our house so everyone would know. And I come inside and I find my husband and we are just spiraling for a whole hour at least trying to figure out who, like which one of our neighbors like would have done this. And so I start like going through, I'm like, okay, so neighbor on one side has had like a tarp over his driveway for a while that says no trespassing. So naturally, anytime the wind blows, I'm kind of like, <laughs> like, what's going on under there? And then I'm like, okay, neighbor on the other side, they have a window that overlooks our backyard. So anytime in the backyard, I'm looking at them to see if they're looking at me. And there's always this like object that kind of looks like a face. So I'm like staring at it to see if it moves. So I go, okay, maybe it's them. I was like, oh, maybe it's the people across the driveway because they have a giant window that perfectly frames their giant TV. And so sometimes I like kind of watch what they're watching because they get channels that we don't. <laughs> um, and I was like, you know what? Maybe it's like not even our next door neighbors. Maybe it's like people down the street because I one time walked past someone's house and they had a raccoon in a cage in their garage. Another time they had like salsa jars and whole slices of pizza. On, I know, on their um, front lawn. And so anytime I walk by, I'm just like, kind of like, what am I going to see today? So anyways, um, as I'm describing this, you're probably like, I'm starting to side with the spray painter on this one. Um, but once I decided that I was never going to ever leave my house again, my husband decided that he was going to bravely enter this scene. So he took my dog for a walk around the neighborhood, and he reported that he saw three more houses with nosy spray painted in front of their driveway. And so while some of you might be like, whoa, okay, cool, it's not just me, it actually escalated it for me. Because I was like, oh, this isn't someone being petty. This is a hit list. Someone is coming around in our neighborhood marking houses that they're going to attack. I started looking up the non-emergency line for our neighborhood to like report it. Fortunately, I had some friends um, that talked me out of it. But even still, I like asked my husband to park his car over the nosy sign to hopefully like foil their plot. So anyways, I have to tell you guys, until this day, I did not know what that nosy sign meant. Um, and someone came up to me. Actually, no, I had like six people come up to me um, after service to tell me that it is a utility marker of some sort. So I can sleep tonight. <laughs> you guys can sleep tonight. No, I'm going to be okay. Um, but anyways, I realized that this is a funny story. But it was actually a really significant moment for me to pause and take an account for where I'm at with my relationship with my neighbors. And if you're here for the first time or you missed last week and you're like, why does she really care about her relationship with her neighbors? Well, to catch you up, Amy talked about last week and showed us how God's mission for all of eternity has been to pursue friendship with us. And as friends of Jesus, he has given us his spirit to go do the same thing, to go pursue friendships with others. Maybe some of you are here in this room now because you're friends with someone who goes here. And if that's you, welcome. And just know that this is not some, when we talk about this, this is not some creepy plot to take over the world. This is just regular human beings who have caught onto the dream of a God who wants people to know that they are not alone that they are seen, that they are loved, that their story matters. And the only way for people to experience that in a tangible way is through friendship. So we say as missionaries for Jesus, we are simply friends of Jesus who make friends wherever we go. 
Which is why this nosy experience was so sobering for me, because I realized that for most of my neighbors, we're not, I can't really say that we're friends. I'm just friendly, which is not the same thing. And man, once I sat with this, I actually got really, really frustrated. Because I don't know about you, but I am dazzled by this mission of God. It makes my heart come alive. I am dazzled by the vision of this church to be the most fence-hopping, storytelling, meal-sharing, and justice-fighting, storytelling friends that our city has ever known. I am in love with the ways of Jesus. And maybe you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus, but the idea of a world where everyone knows that they're fully known and fully in love may feel inspiring to you, that you want to be a part of making the world a more loving place to be. But I was like, man, if I love this vision so much, why, do I, why am I struggling so much? Why do I feel so stuck? How come I dream of being a person who lives in rich community with my neighbors and yet sometimes hope that they're not on their driveway when I pull in so I don't have to talk? <laughs> How can I have so many good intentions of buying that large family next door a pizza, of asking my neighbor who's always working in her garden to come help me with my disaster of a flower garden? And if I'm being honest with myself, the biggest thing that seems to like keep me stuck is a feeling of like, I want to, but like I actually don't feel like it. That this gap between my house and my neighbor's front door actually feels like a mile long because I just can't figure out or muster up a way to break the plane of discomfort and go start a friendship. What about you? What about this call of friendship where you live, where you work, where you play? Where do you feel stuck? Maybe for you it's as small as just disruption. Like, I like my own life. I just kind of want to hunker down and do my own thing. Or maybe for some of you it's deeper than that. Maybe you're like, I want to follow Jesus, but like, I don't actually really like people that much. <laughs> like, if I'm being honest, like, actually, this church's vision sounds awful. It's not what I want, kind of what I want, but kind of what I don't want. Or maybe you're afraid to pursue friendship with people because you're afraid that they won't like you. You've faced a lot of rejection. You have some insecurities, and so pursuing friendship feels really scary and really vulnerable. Maybe you're like, I feel too broken to be a part of God's story. I'm going to screw it up. Or maybe you're like, I just started a friendship with Jesus. I don't know if he's safe. I don't know if I know enough to be qualified to be a part of his story. But what if I told you that one of the first things I discovered when I was in this place is that Jesus is not looking for perfect. He's looking for hungry. That that feeling of disruption and discomfort is actually a sign that he's doing something. And we're going to see that in our story today. If you guys brought your Bibles with you or you can take a look on screen, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. So we're going to be reading, you'll see the heading there, the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. And it's a very short story, which is on brand for him, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, But my hope is that through this story, wherever you are, stuck, wanting to get started, curious, that you will see a path open up for you to get to grow as a missionary with Jesus. So if you guys will go ahead and turn, again, we're in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. This is what it says. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. So pause there because right off the bat, we have some really good news. And that's that this guy was a tax collector. And our dude last week was a tax collector too. If you don't know what a tax collector is or why it was so significant in that day, their job was they got to set the rate for taxes in the area and often would set it higher than the standard rate so they could collect all the excess for themselves. So we established last week that this is like the human version of the Ticketmaster processing fee. This is the $11 movie theater popcorn. This is the cleaning fee at Airbnb. And because it says that he was wealthy, we know that he took full advantage 
of this position. So I say all this to say that wherever you are this morning, you can relax because we know that we're probably doing it better than this guy who made his living by cheating his neighbors. But something about him was curious. It says in verse 3 that he wanted to see who Jesus was. So even though Zacchaeus had a life on paper that was working for him, he had status, he had security, he had power. Yet when Jesus was coming through, there was something about Jesus that made him curious so much so that he did something that no one else did. It says that he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And I read this and I'm like, you know, honestly relatable. I know, right? (laughs) It doesn't say how tall he was, but do we have any other five foot-ish people in the house tonight? Yes, okay. Tonight, I'm like, shorty's in the club. No, this morning. (laughs) Any other five foot people? (laughs) Okay, so I'm like, I don't know if you've ever been, I don't know if you've ever been in a crowded room or in a club and you're like, you're breathing people's back sweat. Like you're staring at people's armpits. It's uncomfortable. And... And, like, all the commentators I read were like, man, isn't that crazy that this grown man climbed a tree to see Jesus? And I'm like, no, it's not. Like, he didn't want to breathe people's back sweat. So the actual crazy part is not that Zacchaeus climbed a tree to go see Jesus. It's that Jesus stopped to see him. Because scholars say that when it says the crowds following Jesus, that was, like, hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of people And yet, verse 5 says, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. We'll come back to this part, but I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of the story. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This story, I believe, is included in the Bible to show us a savior, a savior who can take hunger and curiosity about Jesus and transform it to a life of friendship and mission with Jesus, a savior who can change a person from pursuing power and pleasure to a person that pursues people, a savior who just by knowing him qualifies us to make him known. If Jesus can turn a man from oppressing his neighbors to blessing his neighbors. I just want you guys to know that we are not as far behind or as stuck as you may think. Jesus wants to give us hope this morning that there is more joy, there is more opportunity in the life around you, and he has carved out a path for us to get to experience it. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to spend the rest of our time dissecting the story of Zacchaeus to see that path for ourselves. You guys ready? Okay, so we're actually going to go all the way back to the beginning here. We're going to read this story again through verse 6, but you guys already heard me read it, so could I ask somebody else who brought their Bibles to read it? No? Uh, Thank you, Corey. I was actually looking at you because I'm like, I hope she raises her hand because I don't have to make someone uncomfortable. The mic is sweaty. I apologize. There you go. Corey, Corey, you can go back to the other. Okay. (laughs) Jesus entered Jericho and was passed through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must say, I must stay at your house today. Can you guys give her a hand? Thank you so much. So I didn't mean to make you read this to test you, but just a little bit, because 
I think one of the most important features of this story is the way in which we hear Jesus call Zacchaeus' name. He was not like an angry father that said, Zacchaeus, Daniel, you come down here right now. No, he was a friend. He was a friend who missed his friend. He was like, Zacchaeus, there you are. I'm so happy to see you. Will you come down? Come out of hiding. I want to come to your house. I just want to spend time with you. And I don't know about you guys, but when I feel a gap between who I feel like I am and who I want to be, my starting point is often shame. Can I tell you what was running through my brain after the dust on the paint, spray paint, no pun intended, settled? I said in my brain, you're a fake. If you really cared about your neighbors, you would be doing more. You're lazy. You know yourself. You're never going to change. Your life isn't going to amount to much because you're just too scared. You're always going to be disappointed in yourself. Or you'd screw it up anyways. I'm like, gosh, where did that come from? Like, does anybody else have that mean brother from Home Alone, Buzz, living in their brain that talks to them? Man, when I was in that place, I just wanted to throw a blanket over my head and just like doom scroll into oblivion. I just wanted to hide. But any time that I feel buried in this place of shame, the Holy Spirit always reminds me of this verse. Can I show it to you guys? This is John 10, 3. And in this um, little passage, Jesus is using the analogy of a good shepherd and his sheep to describe his relationship with us. And this is what he said. He said, he, meaning Jesus, calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of him, of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Do you guys hear what he's saying? He's saying shame is not God's voice. Shame is not God's voice. Shame is not your leader. Shame does not take you anywhere that you want to go. In fact, Jesus is saying, run from it. And instead, listen to my voice, the gentle shepherd who loves you, who calls you his own, and like Zacchaeus, calls you by name. We often assume that our starting point for life change is shame. But Jesus is saying our starting point for life change is hearing him joyfully calling our name. It says Zacchaeus, hearing his name, being called out of hiding, gladly welcomed Jesus into his home. So phase one of growing as a missionary is let Jesus into your home. So question has anybody had guests into their house that they couldn't prepare for? Anybody? A few? Okay. Yeah? Okay. So I've got a story for you. Um, my husband and I went to see our favorite Christian metal band artist in concert. Yeah, I said Christian metal band. And so if you're wondering, like, where does Hannah breathe all this back sweat? It is in these mosh pits for Jesus. <laughs> I'm not necessarily participating, but I'm still, like, you know, squeezed in the pile. Anyways, um, after the concert, my brother-in-law actually knew the band, and he was like, hey, the band was going to be sleeping in their van tonight. They wondered if they could crash at your house instead. It was like not only them, but the opening band was wondering if they could too. So it's like almost midnight, and suddenly I have these eight giant metal band artists who are coming to stay in my 1,200-square-foot house that has one bed, one bathroom, an obnoxious dog. And, you know, part of me, I'm, like, really excited because I was, like, I just paid money to see these guys. I was, you know, cheering for them. And now they're going to come be a guest in my house. But then the, on the other hand, I was, like, mortified because I'm, like, okay, there, like, I, there's dog hair all over my carpet, all over our couches. Like, I haven't cleaned the bathroom. We don't have enough towels, which ended up being okay. None of them showered, which is kind of weird, <laughs> which I still am, like, duh. 
Uh, but anyways, um, and I was like, okay, what are these dudes with combat boots and gauges gonna think of my farmhouse decor? I'm like, they are about to see all of me. And I've imagined if that's what it was like for Zacchaeus. He knew Jesus was about to come sit on the bougie, bougie couch and eat the fancy lamb that he had bought with unjust riches. I, I imagine it being like when a guest comes to your home and like before they can even come in, you're like, hey, 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 just like sorry for the mess in here. And Jesus is like, I came for the mess. I came for the sick. I came to seek and to save the lost. I don't come into your home to be impressed. I come into your home to love you, to be your friend. You don't need a clean house. You just need to open the door when I knock. Wherever you think you are this morning, whatever barrier you think there is, Jesus is like, I can work with that. So phase two of growing in a missionary is let Jesus rearrange the furniture. We let him into our house. We let him rearrange the furniture. So Zacchaeus welcomes Jesus into his home, but does anybody catch that we don't actually get to see their conversation? Does that bug anybody else? Yeah, I'm like, we see Jesus going to Zacchaeus' house. Everyone's grumbling. Next thing you know, he walks out, a changed man. They're having a big Midwest goodbye, and you're like, we didn't even like see, we didn't even see the part where like the stuff happened. It's like, it's like when you're trying to see a recipe on your phone and an ad pops up right over the ingredients. You're like, I just read five paragraphs about how this lady gets rashy when she cooks with olive oil. And now I like can't even see the ingredients. So as long as I've known this story, I've been so frustrated that we can't see their conversation. But the more that I sat with it, I was like, well, you know, this is the Bible. Maybe it was like, there was a point. <laughs> there was a point to this. And I was like, maybe Jesus doesn't want us to misplace the power of conversation over the power of friendship. Maybe he didn't want us to examine his words, but rather to examine his grace. And so as I sat with this, I felt like the Spirit prompted me to imagine this story like a play. Imagine on stage, we see Jesus enter Zacchaeus' home and they sit down for a meal on this set built like a house and then suddenly the lights go down. And when the lights go down to play, what do you start to hear? You hear shuffling, right? The crew shuffling around things on stage. And I know this is gonna sound like a little woo-woo, but I really believe that this analogy checks out to imagine that shuffling sound as the sound of grace moving things around. The sound of the pillars of status and riches of pride being disassembled. The broken picture frames, the broken beds, all the broken pieces gently being restored. The sound of a new room being constructed for listening, for talking, for crying with his new friend Jesus. The sound of promises being scribbled on walls, the sound of a roof being bolted down as a refuge. You hear all this shuffling around on set and then suddenly the lights go up and Zacchaeus is just standing there in a house that looks brand new, like, what do I do now? And let me tell you guys, grace, when you become friends with Jesus, his grace will mess you up a little bit. His friendship, little by little, so many of the things that you've given your time, your energy, your mental space to will start to fizzle in his love. His friendship becomes so satisfying. He will start to heal and you'll start to feel strangely free. Free from needing to chase success. Free from needing to do everything for the approval of others. Free from needing to control and curate a perfect life. Free from pursuing empty pleasures that don't satisfy. And you're like, well, what do I do with my hands now? And that's when Jesus points out. He points to the tables, to the chairs, to the couches. And these were once oriented towards your own comfort, he is now reoriented to make space for others. Galatians 5.13 says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. 
But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So what do we do with our free hands? We put them to the mission of Jesus. We love our neighbors because Jesus didn't come just to save us from something, but to save us for something. He didn't come just to save us from a life that is all about us, a life that leads to dead ends. He came to save us for a life that includes others, a life that reaches eternity. And I don't know if you're like, like me, but when Jesus changed my life, I started to feel like, okay, now I, now I gotta make something of my life. Now I have to like pay him back. And he's saying, no, 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 no. This life of mission is part of the gift of grace. It's like a boat, wait, there's more. Your life on earth will get to mirror your life in heaven. You get a front row seat to the supernatural way that God loves and sees his people. Your love and compassion will increase. Your wonder and joy for life will increase. You'll get to hear people's stories that will widen your world. You will get to share your story and see it encourage other people. You'll get more people to call on when you need help. You'll get more laughter, more life change, more fun. I don't know if you guys remember this diagram that we saw last week. But God is saying us to us that this dream of friendship that I created in a garden, I carried to a man in a desert. I carried to an ark in a flood. I carried to a split seas. I carried to a shepherd king in a field. And I carried to a manger. I carried it to the cross. I carried it to an empty grave. And now I've carried it to your cubicles. I've carried it to your soccer fields. I've carried it to your living room. I've carried it to your tables and your front doorstep. And Jesus is saying, friend, will you follow me? So phase three is we take one step out the door. Verse eight, it says, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Do you guys see how free Zacchaeus is? He's not trying to go back and prove himself to the grumblers like, hey guys, look, I'm a good guy now. No, he says, look, Lord, It's like my husband when he carries my daughter across the monkey boards and she's like, look, daddy, look, I'm doing it. And he's like, yes, I know you could, even though he carried her the entire way. What we see is that through friendship with Jesus, Zacchaeus was set free and his heart was reoriented towards people. Then he took one step in that new direction. And that's our invitation too. As friends with Jesus, what is one step we can take towards friendship with people? We can start by just noticing who is around you. What do you see when you see people? Talk to Jesus about it. Maybe read one book by someone who doesn't look like you, think like you, live like you, to start to condition your heart for our neighbors. Maybe last week you were here, you did that live, work, and play circle, but all you had in those circles were descriptions of people, like the man who brings tuna for lunch or the the family whose kid has a mullet. And now Jesus is like, I want you to start learning their names. Or maybe it's like me and, and you just start praying for one person every time you walk or drive by. And I know sometimes this prayer in my head feels like a cop out, but if you do it with genuine love and a genuine hunger, he's going to do something. This is where I started. And I was just telling God, I was like, God, I just like, I want to reach my neighbors, but the gap feels so huge. Can I ask you to just like close that gap and like make something crazy happen? I was like, I don't know if I can pray that. And he did. I was napping one day and three neighbor boys that I never met before came into my house. My daughter had come in for a drink and 
the boys came in with her. And I was like, oh, hello. <laughs> he will do something. I don't know. Just be honest. Just pray with your sincere heart. And maybe if you're like, okay, I've done these heart things. I've made some connections. I want to move from friendly to friendship. I want to remind you guys that Jesus doesn't lead us along paths of shame and grind. He leads us along paths of freedom and joy. So to, to decide your next step with the Holy Spirit, think about with him, what do you love to do? And how can you grow in friendship with the people around you as you do it? Do you love to cook? Invite people into your home. Do you love to play games? Have a game night. Do you love to hang with girls? Have a girl night. Do you love your dog? Go to the dog park and start meeting people. Or think about what you're doing that you may not love, but could be better with a friend. If you drive to school every day, invite a neighbor kid to come carpool with you guys. If you eat lunch every day, invite a coworker. If you take a walk around your neighborhood, invite a neighbor. We get to start dreaming with the Holy Spirit. What, how has he wired you? Where has he put you? What unique expression of this mission do you get to do with him? What would make you feel excited that you could start doing and get to be surprised about how Jesus uses it? And to put this all in just a real life picture for us, um, about six weeks ago, my grandmother passed away at 97 years old. And as I've been reflecting on her life, I was like, man, she did this. She did this. She loved and followed Jesus. And what else did she love? Eating at restaurants. And every single day, I kid you not, maybe sometimes multiple times a day, she would eat at a restaurant and always invite a friend. And if a friend didn't come, she was making friends with the waitress. There were so many times that my cousins and I went to Bob Evans and the hostess would be like, hey, Sarah. We're like, how do you, you don't work here. How, do you, how does everyone know you here? She also loved going places, but she had nowhere to go herself. So she actually bought a 12 passenger van to take people places that they wanted to go. So she could just spend that time talking to them. She also loved throwing parties. She loved hosting people. She loved gathering in her home. And so even when she was a widow, she kept her five bedroom house so that she could make space for people. Wherever she went, what I observed in her life, and this was only the last third of it. I don't even know what the first 60 years were like. This is the last third of her life. Wherever she went, she was just deeply interested in people. She was so full of joy, the most like zest for life human that I ever know, that I ever knew. And I wouldn't even say that she was really thought of herself as a missionary. I think she was like, I'm just following Jesus and he's changing my heart and he's leading me towards people. All the way until her very final breath, when she was unresponsive, one of the last things that my dad heard her say was, Christ, no, shh. And we were like, I don't know, and I don't, I don't know, of course, what this all looks like, but immediately the image came to my head of my grandmother entering heaven, and she sees there all of the people that she had befriended on earth. And Jesus is like, yeah, Sarah's here. And she's like, no, 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 don't, don't ruin the surprise. So I don't know what this version looks like for you what you want your life to be oriented towards. And if it's friendship with Jesus and friendship with the people around you, I just wanna encourage you. You don't have to be an extrovert. You don't have to get it together. You don't have to swing for the fences and feel like you have to make something of your life. You don't have to, you don't have to commit to this extreme lifestyle. You get to commit to a person who is your friend. You get to commit to a process that is called love. We get to do over and over again what we see Zacchaeus did. We let Jesus into our homes. We let him rearrange the furniture and we take one step that direction. And who knows where he's gonna lead you or who he's going to lead you to. Friends, I am convinced that the way of Jesus is the most beautiful way that we could spend our lives. We just keep following him. We keep following him. We follow him. He does the making until we get to the end of our lives and we get to join the party 
that never ends.